Hello and welcome to the CEC Report for the 2nd of December 2016. I'm Elisa Barwick and joining me today is CEC leader Craig Isherwood. Welcome Craig. Yeah, thanks Elisa. And on today's show, London Wall Street hysteria builds as population revolts against their system and 25 years of economic growth wears the infrastructure. Now, just a reminder, as we've been making before we get started, that community television will not be screening after the end of this year. However, you can still watch the CEC report by going to our website or even easier by subscribing to our YouTube channel and we'll notify you whenever there's a new show. So on to the first subject, London Wall Street hysteria builds as population revolts against their system. Mm. Now, Craig, we are truly in a revolutionary period and it is characterised by a great deal of uncertainty, but it is ex precisely that uncertainty that gives us uh, and those who want change a dramatic opportunity to intervene to bring the kinds of ideas we discuss uh, regularly on the show into actual being. And of course that revolutionary period has been characterised by a number of shock election votes in the recent period, starting with the Brexit vote earlier this year in uh, the UK where they voted to leave the EU, that was completely unexpected. Uh, the Philippines election was another such shock where Duterte came to power as the new president and made the break from the United States, which he recently announced, which has big implications for the uh, Asia pivot that the US has had to dominate uh, Asia. Then we had, of course, more recently the Trump election, which again, no one forecast or saw coming. And we've talked on the show about the consequences of that, which are continuing to unravel and still you know, we don't have anything definitive on that, but we'll know more as the weeks and months pass. Alisa, I think we've seen in the Australian context, uh, we've had the federal election. 35% of people didn't vote for the major parties in the upper house. And we have a Senate now, which has you know, more people in it than the last one, that uh, completely backfired on what Malcolm Turnbull was trying to do. And also you've had the orange by-election, where mm. you've seen the National Party thrown out after you know 50 or 60 years with a huge uh, vote against them at 35%. Some places the polling booths were going up to 90% hmm. swing because they just, these policies that were put in place were so repugnant mm. to the people. And this is an indication of what you're seeing internationally is yeah. that these policies, the repugnant policies, the, the policies of globalisation which are destroying communities, they're destroying people's livelihoods, are being rejected. And the political class, which has been so, seen to be so uh, powerful mm. over these last many years, is now, to be, now seen to be found wanting. The banking system that supports them uh, is being found wanting. I mean, you've seen so many different uh, reports on criminal activity, which is why you know, you're seeing also the rise of the policy of Glass-Steagall. Yeah. In the US in particular, the fact it was supported by Trump, it's supported by you know senators like Elizabeth Warren, and it's also supported by many many other you know former bankers that now see yeah. the only way that you can solve the banking crisis, the financial crisis, is by going back to Glass Steagall. So you're seeing a re as you say you're seeing revolutionary changes in the world uh, because the people are beginning to become mobilised. That's right, and that terrifies yeah. politicians. No, people are waking up. And of course, if they just wake up and there's no solutions or proposals there, there's just a vacuum. That's one thing where the establishment can control that situation. However, we're in a world right now where not only are people of our ilk putting forward solutions and have been pumping away at them for decades, but there's also leaders of entire nations, leaders that we see, for example, the Chinese President Xi Jinping, who's promoting the idea that countries come together in a community of principle to mm. collaborate around mutually beneficial development projects, infrastructure. You've got the BRICS arrangement, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa and they're forming broader groupings with the Eurasian Economic Union, with the Shanghai Cooperation Organisation. So you've got a period in which if Trump begins to ally with something of that nature, whoa, you know, the establishment, the political establishment headquartered in London and the City of London and Wall Street is in big trouble. They lose control. And I think what you saw in the Trump election 
was the media couldn't control this. Yeah, exactly. And we had, you know, complete disinformation coming down here most of the time. Mm. You had a little bit of the actual reality coming through, but we never heard a lot of what was taking place in the back blocks of regular mainstream United States. We only got the media line, which of course trumpeted Clinton. You have an alternative media today via the internet, and a lot of people turn to that alternative media for their news sources, which mm. of course now yeah. is being uh, called the fake news yeah. by the mainstream because they are terrified of the power of the alternative media. So the, constru the control of the mainstream media is being broken big time. Mm, yeah, because apparently President Putin has control of hundreds of media outlets and has the ability to pump out this fake news. He also has the ability, if that were to fail, to directly hack into the US uh, election machines and manipulate the results. So this is what is coming out in the mainstream press in the United States right now. And there's whole websites like Prop or Not, which lists hundreds of these so-called fake news media sources. Uh, saying, you know, these are the news sources that you shouldn't listen to. Of course, everyone's probably going to them now to say, oh, what are we missing out on? Um, but, you know, this is the kind of propaganda uh, campaign right now that the establishment are launching both in the US and in the UK in order, in fact, to try to undo the results because there has been a challenge put in a number of the US states that flipped for Trump, such as Wisconsin, uh, and so forth, where the Green Party actually initiated a challenge, Jill Stein, the Green candidate, and she's been backed by mm. Hillary Clinton in Wisconsin, Michigan and Pennsylvania uh, to do a recount. And it costs millions of dollars actually to have that recount done. And somehow the Green campaign raised more money in a few days to make that happen than what they raised during their entire election campaign. Um, yeah, I think, I think uh, the, the, the warning here is watch the fake news from the major media about the fake news mm. because they're terrified, they're hysterical about, they no longer have the controls when you just had media barons running the radio stations and you had them running the newspapers. Now that no longer is the case, you have alternative media. And in many cases, this you know people know they're being lied to. Mm. We were lied to. And by the way, these you know establishment vehicles that are saying this is all fake news are the authors, the inventors of fake news, yeah. because think about the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, think about the threat of Gaddafi in Libya, think about Assad uh, in Syria, all of the lies that were deliberately told to lead us to war. Mm. And in fact, what they're saying now about uh, the so-called fake news coming out of the media that you know helped Trump get elected and so forth, they're doing this as a means to pump up the war drive again, because it's all anti-Russian propaganda. As I told um, um, a, a grouping of our members on, in Adelaide just recently, I said, if you want to know what isn't fake news, mm. read the alert service. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's, this is not something that we can mm. just put together you know, on a whim. We actually thoroughly researched mm. and we put it together so that people don't get fake news, but they get the fake news that mainstream media are trying to pass as real, as real news. Yeah, they'll get a full analysis. So actually call in if you haven't already to get a copy, a sample copy of that to have a look and find out for yourself. Now we'll stop for a moment, but we'll keep talking about this after the break. Welcome back to the CEC report. And we've just been discussing the attempts in the United States to um, you know, reject the election result of Trump's election uh, by these challenges and vote recounts in a number of states. And it has virtually zero chance of actually working, Craig. Mm. Um, but n nonetheless, they're putting out a lot of propaganda to try to counter the directionality that Trump is indicating he will move in. But I also want to come up, come back to the United Kingdom because there's been a big reaction, um, kind of belated reaction from Tony Blair and his circles to the Brexit vote as well, where they would like to undo uh, those kind of results. So Tony Blair has come out in the last week or so saying that Britain should keep its options open in regard to the Brexit. And he even has touted the possibility of a new referendum. And he's basically saying that it's a bit like someone who agrees to a house swap, you know, on a, for a holiday or something where until you've seen it, you don't really know what you're getting. And so once you turn up and you see it and it's a, you know, a junk hole, you can decide to back out of that. Uh, so he said Brexit can be stopped 
If the British people decide that, having seen what it means, the pain gain cost benefit analysis doesn't stack up. So he's running a campaign to do that and he's saying that he'll be coming back into politics, albeit not into the front line, so probably not as an elected member and acknowledging because he's basically so unpopular he couldn't get away with that. Um, but he says that there's a massive political vacuum. Theresa May, you know, he's not that enthused about. Of course, he doesn't like Jeremy Corbyn because Jeremy Corbyn's standing up for old Labor. Uh, and so he's saying, I will try to create a cross-party grouping, um, you know, that will fill a certain vacuum in UK politics. Uh, and Craig, one of the, well, one of the voices that came forward in the recent period that kind of um, mentioned the, uh, the, the possibility, the, the impetus that you've got for change in Britain was Nigel Farage, who of course is the head of the UKIP party and he's been you know, up in the um, headlines because of his relationship with Donald Trump. But this is what he said the other day, which I think, you know, whilst we won't agree on everything, that this is correct because he's talking about the kind of seismic changes that are going to take place in the United Kingdom. He said, I am not sure what is going to happen over the course of the next couple of years, but I suspect there's another big seismic shock in British politics, perhaps going to come at the next election. I suspect that the Conservative Party is not fit for the legacy of Brexit. I suspect there is going to be a genuine realignment of British politics over the course of the next three or four years. But look, that realignment will only come if there are real solutions offered to the people that are waking up. And Glass-Steagall is the key thing. There's been a lot of support in the UK for Glass-Steagall. It nearly got through the, the parliament in 2013, Craig. And just in the last week, um, Lord Stoddart, who's a member of the old Labor faction over there, he was in the Harold Wilson government, he tabled a written question in the House of Lords asking Her Majesty's government in the light of the statement by President Trump, elect Trump, that he intends to reinstate the Glass-Steagall rules, what assessment would the UK government make of the impact that this would have on the UK banking system? Um, so Craig, explain Glass-Steagall and why that's a crucial element in the fight in the UK. Well look, the global financial crisis has never been dealt with, Elisa. It's in worse shape than it was since 2008. And this is what is the ticking time bomb behind everything that's taking place in UK politics, Australian politics. Look, if you have a look at the cover of our New Citizen, which we've um, just produced, you see that the feature article is about the global financial system. Replace it. Mm. And we're talking, we have a graphic there on the front page about the time bomb of, of the interconnected derivatives of Deutsche Bank. And these derivatives are out of control. They mm. haven't been, the, all the banking regulators in the world haven't wanted to be able to control these derivatives, or haven't been able to control these derivatives. They've wanted to, but because they're off the books, because they're over the counter, as they say, no one knows where these things are, who's counterparty to which, what sort of derivatives uh, are likely to blow up. No one knows this. It's like a complete uh, holding a, a, a hand of cards. You don't mm. know whether you're going to win or lose. Or a grenade. Or a grenade is more like it. Yeah. So what, what Glass-Steagall does, you know, it's a policy that was brought in with Roosevelt in 1933 which says you can't have that degree of uncertainty in your banking system. You have to have a solid, structured, protected, regulated banking system, a commercial banking system that does the work of boring old banking. And all the rest of it, the merchant banking, the investment banking, the stockbroking houses, the insurance companies that have all come together as you know, too big to fail banks, all that has to be broken away and pushed to the side. And all their liabilities and so forth, well, they can basically sink or swim for themselves, but they're not going to get guaranteed or you know, be able to dip in to ordinary depositors' funds. That's what Glass-Steagall does. It's mm. a very simple idea and it's, it's something that's winning support around the world because people are realising you know, we, 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 if we keep supporting this system mm. of, of the current banking system, then we're supporting the banks. And the people are saying, we don't want this. Yeah, and the UK government's response to that question by Lord Stoddart was basically, well, we already have voted to bring in ring fencing, which is a, a Glass-Steagall extremely light. Well, ring fencing, ring fencing says, it, 
you know, well, in Glass-Steagall, you have a completely separate banking system with a separate board. Mm. They have nothing to do with the merchant banking, the investment banking, and so forth. Well, Ring Fencing says, yes, well, we're going to have commercial banking, and we're going to have all these other activities, and we're going to still have the one board over the top. Mm. So it's not a, a complete... Just a wall between the we're two. We're just going to have a, you know... Chinese a, wall. You know, a paper <laughs> wall between the two, because what you know is that, uh, you know, the banks are going to fight any form of regulation and yeah. uh, tooth and nail and find the loopholes. And that's what Senator Elizabeth Warren said you know, back when they started to deregulate the banks. It was the regulators that, uh, in a sense, allowed the loopholes mm. to mm -hmm. be... Uh, gone through and therefore the entire system started to unravel. And even that ring fencing as the UK um, response laid out, it doesn't even come in until January 2019. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> now this is urgent, Craig, because on Sunday, our viewers may or may not be aware, there's a referendum taking place in Italy. And whilst this referendum is about changing the constitution to take away much of the powers of the Italian Senate, they would no longer be able to veto legislation or hold no confidence votes in the leader. And this is touted as something that's necessary because, you know, the parliament supposedly has too much power and that's why Italy goes through so many changes of government, which seems to be the norm now, mm. even here. Um, but it would basically give the EU, the European Union, primacy over Italian law. And this referendum was pushed by the banks to allow the banking system, the EU um, banking union, to have co greater control over Italy's banking system because it's plagued with so much debt and it's got very big banks like MPS, the Monte dei Paschi di Siena, that are on the verge of collapse and which banks like Deutsche Bank are more connected to than any other bank in the world. So basically, if the people of Italy follow this tradition of what's happened in Brexit, in the US election, um, and they vote against Renzi, the Prime Minister's uh, referendum, and they say no, the entire financial system could explode mm. at a very early hour. Yeah. So we need to have Glass-Steagall as a matter of the greatest urgency. Uh, the UK, it has to come up. We have to bring it up here in Australia and everyone should be taking that new citizen, therefore, to their members of parliament to push that matter. Yeah, yeah. So we'll stop there, but we'll talk a bit more about what's happening in Australia after the break. Welcome back to the CEC Report. Now we're going to discuss 25 years of economic growth, where's the infrastructure? Now Lisa, before we get into this subject, I just, I think, following on from our last uh, segment, we've actually launched a petition here in the CEC called Break Up the Big Banks Now, Pass Glass-Steagall. Mm. Now this is a national petition of which this infrastructure question is, forms the third part. Mm -hmm. But we go through and uh, elaborate what we just talked about in the petition but we then call on the House of Representatives to do Australia's part of the global fight and uh, legislate for a full glass steagall separation of Australia's banks to protect normal commercial banking and deposits from the wild speculation of the too big to fail banks. We also suggest and require that they uh, um, legislate for a national bank, mm. model on the original Commonwealth Bank to create massive new credits to revive our manufacturing, agriculture and other productive industries. And thirdly, which has got to do with this segment, the legislates for a program of major water power and transportation projects in Australia and in our region to help us cooperate mm. with China's One Belt, One Road policy. Yeah, we need to have a complete reform of the financial system in order to facilitate the infrastructure. There's no other way out around it. You can't take the, uh, you can't just decide oh, we're going to have infrastructure without uh, looking at the entire banking system mm -hmm. because none of it is going to give the guarantees and the necessar necessary long-term stability mm. for large-scale infrastructure development projects. Yeah, because I mean, here we are, we're constantly told that we've had 25 years of uninterrupted economic growth in this country. Um, and yet, you know, somehow we've managed to have this growth without a skerrick of new infrastructure being built or the ability to do it. You know, there's never any money when, you know, when we want to do something supposedly. Um, and so we have a, you know, you can have even the most minor crisis that hits the country. For example, a couple of weeks ago here in Melbourne, we had a very, it wasn't even that bad of a storm, really. It was just a combination of circumstances which created an asthma crisis because you'd had 
a very high, we'd had a lot of rain and so you had a very high pollen count with particularly the rye grass and then with a very high humidity this caused a particular uh, decomposition of the rye grass pollen particles that was able to be inhaled very deeply and a lot of people had very bad asthmatic reactions to that. Now that's something that you Over know, 8, can... Over 8,000 people. Yeah. I mean... Now it can be managed but the problem was it really exposed the shortfalls within the Victorian healthcare system, the hospital system, the ambulances and so forth. And so eight people, <coughs> eight people have died as a result of this. Now staff of course did a valiant job uh, and did their best but the infrastructure of virtually every segment of the healthcare system was shown to have falling, fallen apart, particularly for example the wait times of ambulances. Um, and that's not just in this storm but across the board and you can read more about that with some of the figures in our latest Australian alert service. Um, so budget cuts, you know, lack of staffing, lack of updating and upgrading equipment and of course the building of new hospitals and new infrastructure um, is a real problem. Yeah, and Daniel Andrews' government has announced, you know, he's going to spend an enormous amount of money to bring in online something like four, five, 450 new paramedics. But this is typical of what happens in politics today. It's always after the fact. Mm. And, I mean, we're, in, we're, we're faced with this question all the time with infrastructure. It mm. requires visionaries within Parliament in order to stand up and say, look, we need this for the country. We need these large infrastructure projects for mm. the country. And I wrote an article yeah. this week in the Australian Alert Service about the fact that the Shadow Infrastructure Minister, uh, Anthony Albanese, for the fourth time has introduced a bill into the Federal Parliament, to his credit, which is demanding that the Parliament set up a committee to look at setting aside the development corridor necessary to build a high-speed rail from Melbourne to Brisbane. And he's saying, look, this is urgent because if we don't set aside the land, the normal building processes will encroach on the corridor and it may become impossible for us in Australia to have a high-speed rail system. Mm. And this is in the background, Elisa, that China has already got 20,000 kilometres of rail system and by 2020, not 2090, 2020, they intend to have 50,000 kilometres of high-speed rail and we have not one. Mm. And I found it also interesting that uh, uh, the, uh, Anthony Albanese said that he's being approached by many Chinese and other Japanese consortiums, people in, interested in building this sort of infrastructure. So there's a real urgency uh, and a lot of interest. And this gloves exactly into the whole idea of us participating in Premier Xi Jinping's uh, idea of the One Belt, One Road yeah. uh, concept and actually building something in this country. But it's going to require, you know, if, I, I, as I said in the article, if he was already Prime Minister, I suspect we'll be building this thing today. Mm. But you've had two dud uh, infrastructure mm. Prime Ministers. They're not doing anything in mm. terms of large-scale infrastructure projects. Yeah, and I think the real issue, as we've been discussing throughout this show, the real blockage here is the Wall Street City of London apparatus that doesn't want this kind of infrastructure because nations that have infrastructure and build and forge a future for their nation and for their people develop, they go forward and they're independent, they're no longer controlled by those financial powers. Mm, and so we need to create that kind of a revolution here in Australia, exactly like what we're seeing unfolding across the world. And for that reason, we need people to, you know, contact us, get a hold of our information and in particular, take that new citizen to your Member of Parliament, send it to the Prime Minister, take it to the other local institutions because the revolution is brewing here, it's just under the surface and we can bring it to the surface with just a very minor amount of work. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that's all we've got time for on the CEC report this week. Contact us for a free copy of the Alert Service. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for joining us, Craig. Yeah, thanks, Elisa. And tune in again next week for the CEC report.